Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us here for another bonus episode, another rural crime episode. Hey, thank you so much for indulging me on this. I really do enjoy doing these so much so I am doing this, man, on a, I think it's about midnight on a Friday night. My week got away from me. Matter of fact, we were gone the first part of the week uh, up in the mountains, and so I got back and am compressing a lot of work into two days. But uh, happy to do this and wanted it to be out for you in the morning if you were expecting it. So here we are doing another rural crime episode. Happy to jump into that. Well, hey, let's do this. I want to start off with my tip of the week. And this is actually not something I thought up. This is advice that was given to me by another police officer that I used to work with. And it's something that I think we should all really think about. And that is a lot of us are going to keep a gun in the home for home protection. Not all of us. And, you know... I don't know what to think about all that. I mean, I do. It's something I do. It's a tool that I have, and in the spirit of Captain Woodrow F. Call, better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And that is true unless something goes wrong with that tool. It gets into the wrong hands and there's some sort of an accident. So a couple things I want to talk about in terms of that. Keeping a firearm in the house, and what do you do if, God forbid, you are that rare statistic where somebody actually breaks into your house in the middle of the night or something like that. So what can you do? A couple things I want to suggest. I always suggest any firearm that you're going to have in the house, you keep locked up. Now, as kids get older, there is, I, I think there is a, an, a, I don't know, an increasing level of trust you can have with them. I'll give you an example. We have a small rifle I keep by the back door for foxes. You guys have all heard me talking about all the different foxes that we've shot on the farm that keep coming in and killing our chickens. So I keep a rifle right there so I can grab it right away if I do get the opportunity to eliminate a fox. So I do that. But everything else in the house is locked up. And my daughter has been taught to shoot. She is much, much older now, uh, 14 years old. 14 years old here in a few days, I should say, and I have a lot of trust and a lot of faith in her doing the right thing and not doing something foolish with that rifle. And as a matter of fact, uh, I would even be somewhat comfortable if she were home by herself and a fox showed up and she went out and she took care of the fox. And so it's part of her duties here on the farm, uh, honestly. But with that said, when she has friends over, or we have relatives over with small children, I lock that gun up. It goes into the safe, and a fox shows up during that point in time. Well, that's just my bad luck, Uh, but I lock it up because it's worth it to me. And so I suggest everybody keep their firearms locked up. Now, even if you don't have kids in the house, here is a good reason to do that. And again, this goes back to advice that I was given that I listened to and I thought about and I really, really liked, and I want to pass it on to you. So even if you just keep one handgun in the house or something like that, get one of those little fingerprint, fingerprint-based fingerprint safes or a little combination safe, a key-operated safe, or one of the ones with the little touch pads with a code, and just have it in there. Even if you're not going to secure it to something, have the gun locked in there. And here's why I suggest that even if you don't have young children in the house and you don't have any coming over. And the reason I suggest that is because it made a lot of sense. You wake up in the middle of the night and you hear a noise. And I have read over the years tragic, tragic stories of people waking up in the middle of the night, grabbing their gun, seeing somebody moving about, shooting them, and it being somebody they love, somebody they care about who just for some reason or another is in an abnormal part of the house at an abnormal part of the night. And it's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. And we don't want that to happen. So lock that sucker up in something something. Even if it's right next to your bed, if it's locked up in something, two things. If, my goodness, somebody were to come into your house in the middle of the night and you were not to wake up until they were in your bedroom around you, they're not obtaining that firearm before you do. They're not seeing it and grabbing it. That's one thing. But the more important thing and the more likely thing that we need to take care of is we need to give ourselves time to wake up. If we hear something, we think there's a threat in the home, and we're waking up, and we're grabbing a firearm, 
we need to give ourselves time to wake up. You come out of a REM stage of sleep, and you're, it takes a minute to get your bearings, to understand what's going on, where you're at, what's going on, all of that. And if you have to think about the combination and open that safe or open that little container, that's going to help wake you up so you can make better judgments with that deadly weapon and avoid that tragedy of accidentally discharging that weapon at somebody who belongs in that house because you're still groggy, you're still asleep, you're just barely waking up, and you just don't even have your bearings about you. You don't have your wits about you. So lock that sucker up in something, and lock it up in something that you can retrieve it from very quickly. But it's just that conscious thought of what do I have to do to get this thing out that's going to help help to wake your mind up and help you to make better decisions. So that's my tip there. Uh, next week, I will try and remember to do one about what you do next if you wake up and there's somebody who's actually broken into your house. But man, and it'll be it'll be based along the same piece of advice that I was given that I really, really liked. So if that occurs, you want to have that locked up so you force yourself to wake up before you get that thing out. Because the odds are, the odds are truly higher that you will accidentally get that gun out for somebody in your house doing something strange that's not normal but who belongs there rather than somebody actually breaking in. I'm not saying not to have a weapon for home defense. Don't get me wrong. Just make yourself do something so you don't make a tragic mistake. All right. Well, let's jump into uh, rural crime in the U.S. So a couple stories this week. Uh, This first one takes me back to my days as a detective when I was a domestic violence investigator. And uh, I wanted to read this one to you. This comes from actually from Washington State University, which has a really, really great criminal justice PhD program and and great criminal justice program up there in uh, Pullman, Washington, uh, right across the river, I think, from Moscow, Idaho. Two universities very close right there. University of Idaho and Washington State. Uh, This article is titled, Small Towns Have Highest Risk of Intimate Partner Violence. Intimate Partner Violence is something we used to refer to as domestic violence. Now we call it intimate partner violence. Uh, we don't want to I, We don't want to forward any stereotypes or any beliefs that people have to be married for this to be an issue. People that live together, people that are dating, this happens among those, uh, those um, couples as well. So let me read this to you really quick. Despite common perceptions that big cities have more violence, women living in small towns are most at risk of violence from current or former spouses and partners, according to a recent study by Washington State University criminologist Catherine Dubois. Uh, for the study published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence, Du Bois analyzed the responses of more than 570,000 women from the National Crime Victimization Survey. From 1994 to 2015, she found that women from small towns were 27% more likely to be victims of intimate partner violence than women from the center of big cities and 42% more likely than suburban women. Now, remember, we talked about this a few weeks back. The National Crime Victimization Survey is the best place to get crime statistics because it reaches out to people and it asks them, have you been a victim of this certain crime? What you know? What were the circumstances of it? those types of things? And that's better than going to police reports because not everybody, in particular, not people in domestic violence or intimate partner violence situations, report when they've been victimized, when they've been a victim of crime. But through a survey of potential victims, we can get a much clearer look at what's really going on out there in society. A quote from the professor here, in criminology, we often have this urban bias We assume big cities are the worst and paint other places as idyllic, said Du Bois, associate professor at Washington State University, Vancouver. Uh, We tend to think in a continuum from urban to suburban to rural, but for intimate partner violence, it's actually the suburban areas that are the safest and small towns that have the highest risk. Uh, So let's park on this for a second. I won't read the rest of this article to you. Uh, But a couple things. I know that this professor draws a distinction about women as victims here. Two things. Don't get offended by that, guys. Okay? 
uh, all my guys who are listening to this. Don't get offended by that. The reason, the reason women are singled out is, A, because that's what the study is showing. The, these studies, the National Crime Victimization Survey, they're going to ask the gender of the respondent. So she's specifically looking at female respondents. Now, by the broad definition that we have in criminal law of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, whatever word you want to use to describe it, yes, of course, we do have men who are victims of intimate partner violence. But there is a big difference. There's really two kinds of intimate partner violence. And in our criminal codes, we lump them all under one title, domestic violence or something of that, uh, of that uh, respect. However, there is intimate partner violence that is, the, that is the result of poor conflict resolution skills. And we see both men and women as offenders in this type of, I'm going to refer to it as domestic violence. We see men and women both as offenders here where they get angry and they resolve their conflict through some form of physical violence hitting throwing something punching scratching biting strangling whatever we have that and then we have power and control type domestic violence this is the very dangerous type of domestic violence this is the type of situation where somebody is exercising power and control over a weaker person a physically weaker person and this always escalates because ultimately the person who's being controlled, they become more and more immune to what the person was using before. So the person who's trying to control them has to escalate. It leads to physical violence. And then, of course, that physical violence escalates all the way up, left unchecked, can lead to serious bodily injury, and, of course, it can lead to homicide. And so that's a really serious thing. Now, these, this is if you look at our domestic violence arrests overall, this is going to be a very small percentage of overall domestic violence arrests. Most domestic violence arrests that we call domestic violence are going to be for what we call situational violence. And you're going to see women victimizing men and men victimizing women in the situational violence situation. But when it's true power and control domestic violence, well, then it's almost exclusively men victimizing women because women simply aren't powerful enough, strong enough, physically to control a male counterpart through physical violence. Now, I know you're going to cite a situation and go, well, wait a minute. I knew this woman. She was abusive and her husband kowtowed to her. I understand what you're saying. But what I'm saying is that husband, if he wanted to leave the house, almost in 100% of the cases, he's going to be strong enough that if his wife tried to stop him by physical violence, she would not be able to. He would be able to leave. But if you flip the, flip the script on that, and now you've got the woman who's trying to leave the house, and the man who's physically stronger is like, no, you are not leaving, he will be physically able to stop her from leaving. And so that's where the difference comes in, and that's why we focus on women so many times when it comes to domestic violence. But yes, under our broader definition of domestic violence, yes, men are victims of domestic violence as well. But when it comes to this power and control then that is just women. So I bring up this article. I'm, I'm talking about this article. I feel like I don't know. I don't, I don't want to just tell you about it and then just kind of leave you hanging. Let's talk about what you can do. So what if you have somebody in your community that you know that is experiencing this? What can you do? So you've got a woman in your community who is experiencing this. The first thing you need to know about this is that if she is undergoing true power and control domestic violence, then the offender, her husband or her boyfriend, her live-in boyfriend, whatever that may be, their objective is going to be to socially isolate, isolate her, isolate her from her family, isolate her from her friends, isolate her from her social network, get her fired from her job. So she's got nowhere to go. She's just planted in that house planted in that apartment, whatever that may be. That is that person's goal. And so with that knowledge, you've got to understand how frustrating it's going to be for you as a friend or a family member when this person is telling you what's going on or they're insinuating what's going on and you want to help and you're like, just leave, just get out, just go. But there's so much built into this, both the mental part of what this person's going through, the psychological part, 
uh, what's tied up in family assets, if there's kids. I mean, there's so uh, guilt, uh, gaslighting, all these types of things that are that are tied up into this very, very toxic relationship. There's so much tied up into this that while it's very simple for you to say, why don't you just leave, it is not nearly that simple for the victim in this case. And so as your frustrations grow because she's not just leaving and you say, well, that's it. I'm not going to try and help anymore. This is taking too much of a toll on me. And by the way, that's very understandable. Then if you cut her off, you're helping this guy to achieve that isolation that he is seeking, to leave her more and more helpless. She will eventually leave, but she has got she's got gut instincts. I mean, we're talking primal gut instincts, survival instincts here, and she will eventually leave when she feels like the benefit of leaving outweighs the cost because what's the cost? The most dangerous time for the victim of a power and control domestic violence situation is when they leave, when they attempt to take control back. And when they do that, that is when they're most likely to be a victim of a homicide or an attempted homicide. And so they're weighing the cost versus the benefit of of leaving all the time. And when it gets dangerous enough or when it seems like the danger has subsided enough that making an escape, leaving is more possible, they will leave. But they're going to leave on their own terms when it's safe for them, when it's safe for their kids, when they finally have that realization. But it's much, much more difficult for them to leave if their social network is broken down and they don't have somebody there for them. So first and foremost, man, just find a way to suck it up, to live with this for a while, and to be there for them when they're ready to go. And just plant seeds. You tell them, hey, look, you know, uh, here's a strategy. Tell them, hey, look, I'm going to put $500 aside. I'm going to keep it in the top of my closet or whatever it may be. And if and when you decide you need to get out, you just call me and you've got money for gas, you've got money for food, you've got money for a hotel. You can be five towns over. I'll put it on my credit card. There's no way he's going to find you. We'll get you somewhere safe. Plant that seed. Be that kind of resource and help that person out. Um, and just plant that seed and let and and let them know that you are there as a resource to help them if and when they become ready. Now, should you? Should you not call the police? Uh, if you know that this is going on, my recommendation is, yeah, you should call the police. Uh, there are benefits to intervention. There are laws written to give the police leverage to be able to help a victim in these situations. So yes, it would be my suggestion that yes, you do call the police if you know that there is this type of power and control domestic violence going on. Understanding that when you do that, you should be very sure of what you're doing because it can really ramp up and escalate the chances for that isolation, for you being cut out of that person's life as a support structure, and also... When the police show up, you just never know how that can escalate it. Now, I'm not saying don't call the police, but I'm saying be sure. You've got to know in your in your you know, in your mind, in your gut, that if I don't do this, she's gonna get hurt really bad, or she might possibly get killed. And man, if you're thinking that, you gotta get on the phone and you gotta do that. So this is a tough situation. I'm sad to say that uh, the statistics bear it out that it's worse in rural areas. But again, isolation, right? Um, If somebody wants to isolate somebody, where better to go than a rural community? So it just kind of goes hand in hand. So uh, that's probably enough on that. Uh, There's really good resources out there if you've got a friend who's in trouble. Your local county, county sheriff's department, your local municipal police department, or your state, if there's a family justice center in your state or something like that, they're going to have tons of resources to help you negotiate this. But man, you you really want to uh, you want to do it right. You really want to do it right. Another thing you might do if you suspect things are going on is you might do a risk assessment or a threat assessment. Uh, there's a company called Gavin De Becker and Associates. You can look them up online, and they have a threat assessment tool called Mosaic. 
Uh, it is a great tool. Uh, I used it when I was a police officer investigating domestic violence. I had my interns use it uh, to uh, do threat assessments for people coming in on misdemeanor cases. And Gavin De Becker makes it free. The, the domestic violence tool is free for anybody to use. You can sign up. You can use it. You can go through the threat assessment. You can go through it with your friend or your relative who might be going through this. And a lot of times that can be very eye-opening for them as well. So everybody, if you need resources on this, there's a ton out there. You can shoot me an email if you want, and I'd be happy to try and help direct you to resources. I'm not going to sit here and give advice or counseling or coaching on what to do in a domestic violence situation. Uh, that part of my life has passed, and I am not. I can't do it over the phone or over email. Uh, incur. I, I just don't know enough about the situation to do it responsibly, but I'm happy to direct you two resources. My email address is matt at offincome.com. And if you know of anything like that going on, yes, I'm definitely happy. Ha, excuse me, it's midnight. Definitely happy to help you uh, get tuned into the correct resources to help with that. All right. Well, for our next story, I wish I had happier news. Uh, it's kind of dark this week in terms of what's going on in the U.S. Uh, this comes out of Spectrum News out of looks like Austin, Texas. The title of this article is Texas Family Searching for Answers After Granddaughter's Horse Shot and Left for Dead. Caldwell County, Texas. A Caldwell County family is left both sad and angry, wondering who could have come onto their property and shot a prized family horse in the head. Now a national nonprofit has stepped in, offering a reward for information leading to an arrest in the case. All right. Okay. So it says here, with mom and dad both at work, Lily Dillon had been spending extra time at her Nana's house outside lulling. The arrangement allowed not only for more quality time with her grandmother, but also more opportunities to be around the family's rescue horses. And I'm going to scam down here. It says, roughly two weeks ago, uh, Branning woke up, went out to the barn to care for the horses when she discovered Midnight was bleeding from the head the result of an apparent gunshot wound. She also had a broken shoulder, which ultimately led to her death. We had to put her down. And uh, I'm looking at pictures here on the article. I'll link up in the show notes uh, to this. But certainly, I don't know. I think there's a possibility that uh, looking at this, something else could have happened besides a gunshot. But I'm going to trust the authorities on this, that they were able to determine that it was a gunshot. Maybe there was other evidence of that or something like that. It says here, Dylan was short for words, visibly saddened, and when asked by her grandmother what she missed about midnight, uh, she doesn't have the heart to tell her granddaughter what really happened. Authorities in Caldwell County are investigating several possible scenarios, including the possibility that the shooting was the result of a horse theft gone horribly wrong. Hmm. After, the, after hearing the family story, National Animal Welfare Nonprofit Guardians of Rescue put together a $5,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction in regard to Midnight's death. So if you're uh, in this area of Texas and you're hearing this, if you have any information regarding the case, please contact Caldwell County Sheriff's Office at 512-398-6777 or Guardians of Rescue at 888-287-3877. Six, four. So that one's interesting. You know, we get those occasionally out here where somebody will find a cow or a horse or a lamb or something like that just shot out in their pasture. And that's a little bit more, understandable is the wrong word, but, you know, you picture somebody out just being an absolute jerk, uh, bored, and they've got a gun, they want to shoot something, and they shoot a, they shoot a livestock animal. But this is weird. Going into the barn... And shooting in the horse in the head. And, and why would you, I mean, I suppose if you're a bad person and you want to steal a horse, you might have a gun on you. But if you're trying to steal a horse, shooting it's not going to help you get the theft done. It's only going to increase the chances of you getting caught. So what is, they shoot the horse out of spite when it wouldn't come along willingly? Uh, it's odd to me. I don't, under, that, that, trying to say this is a horse theft is very odd to me. Uh, I don't know what it was or what it is. The fact, I will be honest with you, my suspicion 
come into this case would be if, if I got called out and they said somebody shot my horse and the horse also had a broken shoulder, my suspicion would be is a broken shoulder on the same side of the horse's body as the injury? Can we conclude for sure it's a gunshot? I mean, there was a case, gosh, it's not even a case, but there was a scenario, and you can find this on the internet, but this happened uh, years ago, 10 years ago or something like that. woman gets in her car on a hot day, hears a boom, something hits her in the back of the head. She reaches back, touches her head, she feels something mushy. There's something white and mushy on her fingers. She thinks that she's been shot in the head, and that's tissue or brain tissue. And it was a uh, it was a container of like ready to bake Pillsbury biscuits or something like that that blew up in the heat and splattered all over the back of her head. And I'm just saying there are times where something seems like something happened, but in fact something else happened. I'm not saying that's what happened here. I don't know anything about the story other than what I'm reading. Uh, but it is very interesting. Uh, I can't picture the scenario where this would happen. And why somebody would actually shoot the horse. But with that said, if you have any information or any thoughts or any leads, hey, let these folks know. That's an odd, odd story. Well, hey, everybody, let me take a quick second to acknowledge our great sponsors, of course, Lacrosse Footwear. You can find them over at lacrossefootwear.com. Such a huge fan of this company, huge fan of their Alpha Range boots. Use them every single day on my farm. Just had them on this evening when I was out irrigating, changing the water. And hey, we want you to do the same. Uh, done right since 1897 when they started making rubber horseshoes man they've been on a roll ever since making great equipment for all the farming and ranching needs we have all around our great country and uh, we want you to be lacrosse fans just like we are here at off farm income you can find them over at lacrossefootwear.com and then of course powder river livestock handling equipment the absolute finest in livestock handling equipment you can find them at powderriver.com. Done right. I mean, they've been over 80 years developing livestock handling equipment out here in the West for the toughest to handle livestock we have in the United States. And they have developed quality equipment that can handle that breed of cow. They can certainly handle yours as well. Check out everything they've got to offer you over at powderriver.com and let your local farm and ranch retailer know you want to see Powder River livestock handling equipment out in their sales yard as well. All right. Well, what is our next story? Let me jump to that one really quick. So we're going to move on to our uh, where the Second Amendment does not exist segment and uh, jumping back over to the United Kingdom. And I just cannot stop talking about this. And you're probably getting bored and hearing it. But here we go again. Suspected dog attack kills seven sheep in Cheshire. Now, I don't think this is the same article I talked about last week. And I know there's this is ongoing over there because there's another article, I just didn't put it in the list today, of somebody else's dog killing just a single lamb. This is going on like crazy over there, it seems like. And I can't. I'm, I tell you about keeping a rifle in my back door to take care of the foxes killing our chickens. Man, if I had dogs coming and killing my sheep, that's exactly what I'd be doing there. So they must be restricted in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is out of Farming UK. Suspected dog attack kills seven sheep in Cheshire. It says the forces rural crime team released horrific images showing the aftermath of a suspected livestock worrying case. So that's got to be like harassment. I would assume figures show that livestock worth 1.2 million pounds were savaged by dogs last year in the United Kingdom. 1.2 million pounds. The incident occurred in a field in Tatton Hall area on Sunday, the 2nd of August, according to Cheshire Constablery, Constable, Constablery, they're constables there. Uh, four photos of dead sheep were shared on the Cheshire Police Rural Crime Team Facebook page. PC Tether said, this afternoon I attended a report of livestock attack in the Tatton Hall area, which occurred the previous evening. Sadly, this attack left seven sheep, which were all used dead. It's likely this attack was caused by a dog. No one has come forward to report the incident. So if it was somebody out walking their dog off leash, they are not doing the right thing. Please ensure if you choose to walk through a field where there are livestock or cattle, you keep your dog on a lead at all times and follow the countryside code. So I know I'm I'm kind of bagging on them over there saying, you got to shoot these dogs, but 
Obviously, they weren't there when it happened. Otherwise, they'd be able to say for sure it was a dog and whether or not there was an owner and and all of that. Man, I just, it just blows me away uh, what I keep reading about. And by the way, more articles uh, over here where uh, they're talking about how many sheep are being stolen during the COVID shutdown. I didn't put that article in here. I decided not to cover that one. But man, people are just stealing sheep left and right over there too, uh, which is really interesting to me. And I know they got bigger social safety nets than us there for food and things like that. So it's confusing to me. And by the way, other articles I'm not telling you about, South Africa. And I'm not telling you about this because it doesn't really fit into the theme of what I'm talking about here because they are armed down there. But I cannot believe what I am reading about murders of farmers in South Africa. I don't want to gloss over that and not mention it. It's just not, it doesn't fit in with what I'm trying to cover here. But my goodness, you guys, there is a crisis. There are farmers being murdered left and right in South Africa. Uh, And it appears it's just, it's theft of food. It's robberies. It's unbelievable stuff. Uh, But don't want to gloss over that. All right, our next, not uh, where the Second Amendment doesn't exist article. Let me bring this one up for you. Uh, so this one is all about mental health. And this is really interesting to me because this is out of Farmers Weekly over in the United Kingdom. And of course, the mental health of farmers in the United States is a hot, hot topic, a very hot topic. But it's not isolated just to the U.S., which I found interesting. And it's interesting the the uh, connections they, they come up with here. So the title of this article is Mental Health Anguish Linked to Rise in Rural Crime. So stick with me here. A rising tide of rural crime is causing mental anguish to farmers and threatening their businesses, a report has warned. And now there are several articles this week about spikes in rural crime in the United Kingdom. Think about our farmers in the United States and what they're going through in terms of mental anguish and depression and things like that and then all of a sudden they start getting victimized and where they were having a hard enough time making it already now somebody's stealing their stuff and making it almost impossible for them to turn a profit for them to keep their farm whatever that may be you can see where this would come into play it goes on to say here the cost of rural crime has risen by nine percent to 54 million pounds over the past 12 months its highest level for eight years According to the NFU Mutual Study, crime in the countryside has risen across all UK nations and regions and is expected to increase further, it warns. Criminal gangs are stealing expensive pieces of farm machinery, but they are also taking smaller high-value items. Targets include GPS kits worth thousands of pounds, which is then sold on the black market market. NFU Mutual Rural Affairs Specialist Rebecca Davidson said the coronavirus lockdown had initially led to a decrease in rural crime, but there were signs that criminal activity was starting to escalate as the economic impact of the pandemic began to bite. So it's not just about going hungry, it's about not having income. That's interesting. At the same time, farmers were having to deal with an increase in dog attacks against livestock and an influx of walkers on their land. Walkers. If you walk, watch The Walking Dead, you, you're thinking zombies. But no, I think they're talking about trespassers and uh, people who have nothing to do because everything's shut down, so they're trespassing going for walks. Incidents of fly-tipping waste, which I believe is just littering and dumping in the countryside, had also increased while local authority recycling centers were closed. Why would you... I don't know. Sorry. I don't know why you would shut down recycling centers because of COVID, but I think they did. These crimes compounded by the extra pressure of COVID-19 can seriously affect the well-being of farmers who work long hours and often in isolation. And I totally believe that. So that is very interesting what's going on over there. And again, you know, I, I credit the fact that we don't have rashes of farm crime agricultural crime in the United States with the fact that we do have the Second Amendment and we have that perception that farmers are armed and they can shoot just because somebody's trespassing trespassing on their land. Even though they can't, even though that's not real, that perception, I think, really does a lot to quell agricultural crime uh, in the United States. Because what other reason would people 
stop themselves from committing agricultural crime. It's so isolated, so easy. All right, so let's uh, get to our one for the good guys segment here. I get a little swig of water there. This comes from Y'all Politics. Never heard of this uh, publication, but that's a cool title. Y'all Politics. And it says here, Ag theft investigation leads to recovery of stolen tractor and disc in Clark County. This comes out of the Mississippi Department of Agriculture and Commerce. The Mississippi Agricultural and Livestock Theft Bureau, MALTB, the lead agency in a stolen tractor theft investigation made an arrest and recovered a stolen Kubota tractor and tough line disc in Clark County. The investigation was led by MALTB investigator Jamie Taylor with assistance from investigators Jim Stone, Leon Wedgworth, and Leonard Bentz. Quote, I commend Director Dean Barnard, MALTB investigators, and the Clark County Sheriff's Office for their efforts in solving this case. And I'm glad all the equipment was recovered and returned to the rightful owner, said Mississippi Agricultural Commerce Commissioner Andy Gibson. For our farmers and ranchers throughout the state, their livestock crops and equipment are their livelihood, and we aim to protect and serve our agricultural communities. On August 3rd, 2020, investigators issued a search warrant at a residence in Clark County, which led to the recovery of the stolen tractor and front end loader, as well as the disc that were previously reported stolen in Greene County. On July 18th, the value of the property stolen was $45,000. Uh, during the course of the investigation, Investigators arrested Delrico S. Strickland, age 43, of Clark County. He was charged with possession of stolen property, and he also had an outstanding warrant from the Mississippi Department of Corrections. The investigation is ongoing. So good for them. Well done, ladies and gentlemen. Really well done. That is great. And it's great that Mississippi has that. Uh, some states have that on a state level. I know Florida does. I believe Missouri does, uh, where they've got a state enforcement on agricultural and rural crimes. And I think that's great. I think it's a great investment by the state uh, that they do that. And they've got the resources out there to write and serve search warrants. I mean, that's time consuming. You go to write a search warrant. That takes a police officer off the street for a good four hours because you have to write up the affidavit. Once you write up the affidavit, you have to go meet with the prosecuting attorney or a deputy prosecuting attorney. Um, they've got to go through it. They've got to establish the probable cause. They've got to actually write the warrant. Uh, then they're going to take both of those with you in front of a judge. And if it's not during regular business hours, you're going to the judge's house, whoever's on call, because you've got to stand in their presence, raise your right hand, and swear to tell the whole truth if you're going to be the affiant as the investigating officer. And then the judge determines whether or not to issue the warrant. And then once you get it, now you get to go out and you get to serve it. It's a big, big process. So good for them for putting together the resources that can go out and do that. Okay, this next one is from the Daily Democrat. So we had y'all. I'm sorry, I've, I'm loving these titles. We had y'all politics. And the next one is the Daily Democrat. Okay, this is coming out of Yolo County. Yolo County man arrested for stealing bee boxes. Now, that's a brave thief right there, right? Or somebody who knows about bees. Uh, man, those bee boxes are heavy too. Huh. It says suspect also allegedly stole motor vehicles and was in possession of meth. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're high on meth, you're not afraid of a few little bees now, are you? Unless you're paranoid. Uh, it can go either way. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yolo County Sheriff's detectives reported the arrest of a man on suspicion of stealing more than 70 bee boxes. Man, that is big time. The arrest of Justin Perdue, age 35, took place in the 34,000 block of County Road 25, southwest of Woodland, on Tuesday. Detectives reported via Facebook. Additionally, Perdue was also in possession of two stolen ATVs and a stolen motorcycle as well as an unspecified amount of methamphetamines. Detectives search, uh, excuse me, served the search warrant as part of an ongoing agricultural theft investigation and recovered more than 70 bee boxes full of honeybees and valued at over $18,000 as well as beekeeping 
supplies. The bees in the boxes are used to pollinate almond orchards and other crops, which bring in millions of dollars to Yolo County. Almonds are the county's leading agricultural commodity. The boxes, which are typically marked in some way by the owners, are being returned. It says here, bee box thefts are unfortunately common in Yolo County and the surrounding area, according to detectives. Honeybee theft has not been previously reported as a significant problem in Yolo County, although it has been severe elsewhere. There have been thefts reported in surrounding counties, notably Butte and Yuba. The most recent bee theft report was in January from an Oregon-based beekeeper who told authorities 92 honeybee boxes brought to the state to pollinate almonds disappeared from an orchard near Yuba City. And Merced County Sheriff's Department agricultural detective Chris Zaraki said around the same time thieves in, thieves in western Merced County allegedly stole 32 honeybee colonies and Merced County is quite a ways from woodland so that's interesting so bee boxes man I'll tell you anything that's not nailed down sometimes you know you drive around you see you know you got a marginal area that can't really be farmed where I live here in Idaho and you see bee boxes stacked up it's a great way to take advantage of that ground but of course a lot of the commercial bee people here in Idaho where I live or Montana or Oregon which is really close Early in the spring, late in the winter, they're taking their bees down to California to pollinate those orchards. And uh, obviously there's value there for the thieves who are taking them. And uh, I don't know, when you're on meth, you can see value in just about anything, I think. Anything that's not tied down and you want to go steal it. Uh, so, yeah, very interesting. Bee boxes. So, watch your bee boxes, everybody. You never know. Who's going to steal your honey? It's not just Winnie the Pooh anymore. All right, last one we got here. Uh, this comes from, looks like Channel 10 in Tampa Bay, Florida. It says here, the sheriff is saying a teen facing felony charges in connection with a month-long crime spree. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office has arrested a teenager for burglarizing multiple places. I got a picture here from... Surveillance video of him uh, getting into a shed. It says, in Sefner, Florida, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office has charged a 16-year-old with felonies and misdemeanors for what investigators described as a month-long crime spree. It began on June 26 when authorities say the teen forced entry into Collier's Mower Repair on Florida Avenue in Sefner. There, he stole cash from the register and the DVR used for surveillance video. Together, detectives say they were worth about $390. Now, let me stop there for a second. If you're going to have surveillance video on your farm, you're going to use this as a crime detection, crime dissuasion technique. We need to come up with technology. It's got to exist. It's got to exist to where stuff being recorded is being captured by the cloud in real time or in a very, very fast upload, or it's being able to be transmitted, say, from your barn to your house so you've got cameras out there remotely but the the main unit capturing the video is in another location so the thief cannot simply just steal the dvr and therefore the surveillance video is done no good so you got somebody who's scouting out a location they see cameras they look in the office or something like that they look through the window in the middle of the night they got a mask on all of that and they see the dvr is sitting right there in the office well now they know that all they've got to do is just break in and take the DVR as well or destroy it to the point where the video can't be recovered because it's all on there digitally. Uh, it's the equivalent of the old time bank robbers or convenience store robbers going in and ejecting the VHS tape that's been recording the surveillance video and taking the VHS tape. So if you get a system, get a system where you can have cameras out in your barn, on your sheds, and the moment the person appears in front of that camera, that image is captured. They can't destroy it. All right, so back to the story. Around 2 a.m. on July 27th, the same teen and an unidentified person are accused of unlawfully entering a detached barn at a Dover home. Investigators say the pair took dirt bikes and two chainsaws valued at approximately $4,500. The person who lives there caught them in the act, but the duo got away. Later that morning... Later that same morning, hmm, 
The teen is accused of breaking into Parksdale Farms in Dover. He, along with an unidentified person, reportedly broke a surveillance camera and stole a John Deere Gator HPX ATV worth $4,000. So they are wise to the surveillance cameras. That's why you got to be able to capture that image before they destroy it. Then on July 29th, the teen is accused of entering a closed barn in Dover. He took three dirt bikes, lawn equipment, tools, and a mountain bike, detective said. The total value of the item stolen was estimated at $7,850. During the overnight hours of July 29th and 30th, the teen and an unidentified person took a Yamaha YZF-R3 valued at $10,000 from a driveway in Sefner, according to law enforcement. The teen's last stop on his burglary spree, according to deputies, was on July 30th, where he dismantled a, Sef- uh, a Sefner property surrounding privacy fence, took down the fence, and gained access to somebody's Polaris ATV. Using a screwdriver, authorities say the teen was able to start the ignition and take the estimated $12,000 vehicle. He allegedly damaged the ignition on that ATV and another, but was unable to start the latter. The teen was arrested last Friday night for his outstanding warrants. He faces charges of nine counts of grand theft, motor vehicle, criminal mischief, three counts of burglary on an unoccupied structure, burglary of an unoccupied structure while wearing a mask. Oh, they've got an enhancement for wearing a mask. It's all about the surveillance video. Interesting. Grand theft, third degree, and grand theft, third degree, twice, I guess. Quote here, this is a great example that showcases the dedication of our deputy, said Sheriff Chad Cronister. There were multiple victims and businesses affected by this young suspect's crimes over the last month, and now he'll finally pay for the crimes he's committed. There is no room for this kind of behavior in Hillsborough County. And I hope this is a lesson to all criminals that our deputies will not stop looking for you no matter how much time has passed. The teen also has a warrant out of Polk County for his arrest where he faces additional charges of burglary and grand theft. Well, I would like to think that this young man, after being caught, will see the error of his ways and move on to a life of being a productive citizen. But I'll tell you, by the description of everything that went on and his sophistication and his knowledge, his ability to start ATVs with a screwdriver, his stealing of the DVR, the destruction of video cameras. I am pessimistic, sorry to say. Hey, that's another thing about video cameras, you guys. If you're going to use them, put them somewhere where they're very, very difficult to destroy. Like hitting them with a rock, hitting them with a piece of pipe. They're not going to be able to do that. And by the way, get spend the extra money and I don't think it's that much extra money these days, and get good infrared cameras for nighttime. As a police officer investigating stockings, I will tell you I have seen some unbelievably shocked stalkers and peeping toms caught on infrared cameras. Uh, It works really, really good. So yeah, if it's a little bit of extra money, don't cheap out. Get the infrared cameras for night vision. They work really, really well. All right. Well, that's all I got for you on this Rural Crime Edition, this bonus episode, everybody. As always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.